So reflecting on the way it is, can you hear me? The um, <clears throat> this is Saturday morning. And the uh, meeting, the retreat uh, that we started, that began, is now coming to an end. Just these kind of perceptions, of kind of mundane experiences. This is Saturday at Spirit Rock. The retreat uh, is. Uh, now in its final phases. So this is this is conventional reality. <clears throat> Conventions are made by human beings, so recognize that they're not ultimately real. And so <clears throat> this morning, you know, it didn't announce itself as Saturday. <laughs> it said, I'm Saturday morning. <laughs> But I have a clock, a <laughs> digital clock, and it says Saturday on it for this morning. I just pointed out an obvious uh, truth that this, uh, you know, that oftentimes the conventions are a reality. Um, spirit rock, this is spirit rock. But that rock that they call spirit rock never says it is that. <laughs> but we call it that. Uh, this is just beginning to know that the way it is, it is what it is, and then the human uh, mind projects onto life the conventions, <clears throat> the language, the titles, the names, uh, this is the this is California, but you know the the land here never says it is California. We say, "You're California." This is uh, so. This is to be recognized that that language, thought, convention, all this is is uh, made by human beings. Made up. It's created by us. <clears throat> so the reality is, it is what it is. And this reflection using language, this it is what it is, is points to this, helps us to uh, recognize this truth that we, we live, we create the world we live in. I create myself as a person. And say, I'm Ajahn Sumato. Uh, that's something that that I project onto this moment, onto this being here. And I'm not saying that it's wrong or it's not a judgment against it, but putting it in the context of the way it is, because otherwise we we get confused all the time. We're always believing the conventional reality is ultimately true. Just like this this bell here. We all know this is a bell, don't we? Because we're Buddhists and we're sophisticated and we we know what a, a bell looks like, Japanese bell. And but then if if um, if we weren't so knowledgeable and sophisticated, we might think that was a pot, or it could be, you know, water container, or it could be for making a stew or something, or you could use it for putting flowers in. And uh, but, <clears throat> and you might the idea that it's a bell might never occur to you. Because you might have a view that a bell is a different shape. 
and and this looks more like a pot. No, th this is like projecting onto this something, you know, from our conventional reality. What what it fits into in regards to its shape and form and and the way we think. <clears throat> but we can say it is what it is. It doesn't say anything, does it? It's not announcing itself as uh, in any as being anything at all. So and it just recognize I I predict this is a Japanese bell. That I I'm telling it what it is. But then if we started uh, boiling a stew in it, some of you would get very upset <laughs> and say, you can't do that, that's a bell. <laughs> and we could really get into a terrible argument about it. This is why, you know, why we have wars and <laughs> This is like in uh, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, you know, the, the war around the two different factions of Lilliputians that are, that are uh, arguing and going to war about which end of the egg do you eat first, the narrow end or the wide end. <laughs> and of course, it's a political satire, but I mean, this is very much, you know, what, it's no more serious than that, you know, around the, the foolishness of thought and preference and prejudice that human beings believe in, the conventions of uh, their, their own thoughts are real, their opinions are right. <clears throat> so then, uh, which end of the egg? And we, uh, you know, it's one side totally convinced it's only proper to eat, start with the narrow end, <laughs> and the other, the wide end. And, leads to, uh, you know, a battle. <clears throat> but if we put that into context of Dhamma, see, that is uh, opinion and view, preference, uh, cultural attitudes. Just like in Thailand, uh, uh, if you point your feet, if you, if you sit here in front of the Buddha Rupa and, and stretch your legs out, and point them at the Buddha Rupa, every single Thai would get very upset because that is rude and disrespectful to the Buddha. But for a new foreigner, Westerner, uh, that isn't. We don't see that as disrespect. So, interesting, I lived in Thailand for so many years. I tired, I I uh, acquired the Thai view, so in the monastery in England, you know, somebody comes in, sits down, points their feet at the Buddha Rupa, I feel, you can't do that. <laughs> 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 because I've already, uh, you know, I've already adapted to the Thai system, where before, if I went to Thailand, that wouldn't have bothered me in the least. I probably would have done it myself. And this is, this is cultural conditioning. There's nothing right or wrong, ultimately right or wrong. It's, it's how cultures form conventions that are agreed upon and etiquette and things like this that, that, we, uh, that we are trained with. You know, so this is where uh, conflicts, uh, cultural conflicts arise. And, through attachment to convention, identity, and, and this ignorance.
So the refuge <coughs> is a Dhammang Sarnangachami, take refuge in the Dhamma. This is Paramatta Satcha. It's the deathless reality, not the conventional reality. Conventional reality can be negotiated and you know, if we if we understand its limitation and don't attach to it, then we can adapt. We have ability to adapt and to, you know, to uh, understand the, the limitation of convention rather than just be bound into it, limited and and part of the program without any vision or a way of seeing it in context. So refuge in the Dhamma then is through awareness. And just like these reflections that I've just repeated uh, just now, and this is a bell, Japanese bell. Just being able to reflect that 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 this, uh, you know, that this this bell is, or this object here is what it is. You know, it's it's not, and, and it so it, it's a recognition of, uh, uh, in the terms of conditions, <clears throat> before you name it, before you decide its function. Uh, it, you know, it's a recognition. Things are what they are. So that's that's before one goes into the conventional mode of that is a Japanese bell. So I, I found it very helpful just to establish that kind of knowledge. Things are what they are. You know, they're, all conditions are impermanent, anicca, dukkha. All conditions, their very nature is unsatisfactory. And that's not uh, to to diminish the beauty or importance of any object, but recognition that all conditions are changing, and then they're they're uh, you know they have no uh, permanent satisfactory quality, and then uh, all conditions are anatta, non-self. So this condition, this is a condition. My words, the, this is a Japanese bell, is a condition. Everything you think, every emotion, every uh, thing that, and whether it's mental, physical, psychic, fantasy, physical object, whether it's important or unimportant, intelligent or stupid, whatever its quality and, condi- and whatever its state, it is a, a condition, it is a sankhara. So this means that, that in this way of reflecting, we, we have this generic term, sankhara, that, that includes all conditions regardless of their qualities, uh, whether they're mental, physical, good, bad, or whatever. So the knowing all conditions are impermanent, it's not another thought process that we believe in, but that's a suggestion, a way of looking, of noticing the way it is rather than a position we take. So if we attach the idea of all conditions are impermanent, then that means we're still bound to the to this sentence, to this position of uh, you know that we are thinking. But even that is impermanent, isn't it? The very statement "all conditions are impermanent" is impermanent. So what's left? Awareness behind that, you know. The awareness allows these conditions to be seen in that perspective of anicca, dukkha, anatta. So 
then the <clears throat> when we have that perspective, then the awareness you can't be aware of being aware. So when you're trying to find out, you know, what is awareness? What is mindfulness? Uh, am I really mindful right now, or am I just, you know, is this really mindfulness, or uh, am I just deluding myself? And so we we attach to the idea of mindfulness or awareness. Is this really mindfulness or uh, am I just deluding myself? And so we, we attach to the idea of mindfulness or awareness. And then we, you know, we're not quite sure whether we are or not because uh, of the thinking process. When we start thinking, am I really aware right now? Am I fully, completely mindful at this very moment? And then I try to, to decide whether I am or not. This is, I'm not mindful, am I? I'm I'm, I'm trying to decide whether I'm, this is mindfulness. And, that, and if I don't see this, this thinking process, uh, and I, I just uh, get caught into it, then that's heedlessness. Where the, the minute you're aware of, of the thinking, you know, am I being mindful or not? That's mindfulness. Be, it's you know it's not the thought but being aware of that is a thought so in uh, in the uh, sangha taking refuge that's uju patipano or practicing directly you know it's not it's not starting with theory and with uh, going in, in any roundabout way it's this direct so thinking itself, even the word Buddha, is a condition. So just thinking Buddha, awareness of thinking, rather than deciding, you know, getting caught in what is Buddha, what is taking refuge in the Buddha, uh, is there really a Buddha, was there really a historical Buddha? Or was that just, uh, you know, was, can you prove that there actually was a historical Buddha? And, and then we get in, lost into, you know, we want historical proof that a birth certificate of Gotama <laughs> <coughs> before we'll believe it. <coughs> this is uh, old thinking, isn't it? and uh, desire to know, and, and, and it's conventional, it's learned, it's, uh, it's conditioned, and arises and ceases. So awareness isn't, you don't, you can't become aware. You, you, you recognize awareness is like this. When I, I remember, the, it's trying to be mindful. You know, before I really understood what mindfulness is, I formed ideas about it's important to be mindful. And then the idea that I'm very heedless and that uh, I needed to be, be mindful. And so I was always trying to be mindful. And so it just, you know, the more I tried, the less mindful I seem to be because you, you're I was so attached to, to trying that I, you know, I could trip over the thing right in front of me because I wasn't mindful. I was trying so hard to be mindful I couldn't see what was right in front of me. So one time I was staying in a monastery with this monk, Western monk, was always kind of preaching at me 
And uh, and they say, mindfulness, mindfulness, and you must be mindful, and it's always going on like that. And uh, I began to hate the sound of the word. (laughs) So then we we were going up a flight of steps, and he tripped. (laughs) And I said, mindfulness, mindfulness. I think they call that schadenfreude, where you (laughs) delight in the suffering of somebody else. So in this retreat, it's a sense of this, this is mindfulness, you know, they're, they're, and just keep reiterating this and trying to point it out. So you, your confidence in being mindful, uh, to develop a trust in it, know it, recognize it, be it, and then you, then you, uh, then you have, you know, then you, re- once you really see it, know it, recognize it, then that's the path, that's the way. The, the path to the deathless. It's the fourth noble truth. But as long as you speculate about it and then try, you know, form, and and then down and say, well, I don't know if that's right or not, and Ajahn so and so says something else, and. And the scriptures say this, and I don't know, you know, and it couldn't be that. And then we're caught in the thinking process again, the doubting, uh, because we've heard other views, other opinions. I'm not asking you to believe, you know, this is not a matter of belief, but it's a, a matter of practice, of investigating. Now, from my own experience of meditation this is this is this is my the reality that what i've seen that this of mindfulness it's not a matter of finding it but of recognizing so in the third noble truth this the insight is realizing cessation now that might sound like something totally different, doesn't it? Like the Niroda Satcha. Just the words can sound <clears throat> like something totally different than, than uh, say, mindfulness is the path to the deathless. But um, Niroda, in this sense, is Sankara's all conditions cease. And where do they cease in terms of right now when you're sitting here in this Dhamma hall? Where, where is it that things cease and you can observe cessation and without being theoretical or ideal, idealistic? And it's in consciousness, isn't it? Being mindful, then there's consciousness, mindfulness, and you can see how your thoughts arise and cease. You can be aware of your doubts when, because you create doubts through thinking. Is this really the path or not? Am I really being mindful or am I just fooling myself? These thoughts, if you just observe them as they are, they are thoughts, they are what they are, they arise and they cease. It's not a matter of deciding whether your thoughts are true or false or right or wrong, but see them as sankharas, thoughts are sankharas, aren't they? They arise and they cease. And the awareness of their arising and ceasing. The awareness then isn't arising and ceasing. It's aware of the sankharas arising and ceasing. So then awareness and consciousness align themselves and wisdom 
Panya. And then this is the past. The path of non-suffering. Uh, it's liberation. Vimuti, freedom. So then establishing this path isn't, you know, trying to find a path, you know, go around looking for the path all the time, but this is it. It's direct, Uju Patipano, the direct practice. This is the path, this is it. Now the self view is how you how you see yourself as a meditator or Buddhist or whatever is and and how you've held uh, the concepts and the conventions of Buddhism. You know, it's a way one identifies with I'm a Theravadan Buddhist, I am a Zen Buddhist. Or I am practicing Vipassana, I'm not a Buddhist. Because some people don't like to, to, to be a member of any religion. Buddhism seems like a religion, so I don't want to be, I don't want to align myself with any religions. But I practice Vipassana. In, in Zen, isn't it, they do that. The, the, uh, you know, I practice Zen, but I'm not a Buddhist. So you can take, you know, you're taking these bits out of a convention called Zen or Vipassana and then and identifying with, with that. So in awareness, you know, we can, we're not saying that's right or wrong to do that, but just noticing it is, uh, it is what it is. It's words, identities, definitions. <clears throat> that create a sense of I am this. I'm not a Buddhist, I practice Vipassana instead. <laughs> because that, that is, uh, that's conventional reality, you know, and, that, and, and to see that, to know that for what it is, doesn't, isn't a value judgment of saying you shouldn't think like that, but just putting your thoughts, the way you regard yourself as a person or regard Buddhism as a convention uh, or Vipassana or Zen, just to see it is the way it is. It's like this. When, when you hear, you know, if you're very attached to Theravada and you hear the word Mahayana, you know, the, it's what does that, you know, how does that affect consciousness? Or if you've been, you know, conditioned to, to think Theravada is right and Mahayana somehow is not the real Buddhism, like some Theravadans easily believe that. And so, so when they mention Mahayana, then you can feel this, that's not real Buddhism. This is all thinking, isn't it? And and attitudes and and uh, attachments to just words, just words, and and then these these words affect us. So that's why, I like prejudices, you talk, uh, Islamic terrorists and things like this, and the word Islam becomes aligned with terrorism. So somebody says that person is. Uh, is a Muslim, and you think, oh, terrorist. <laughs> I mean, in the UK these days, uh, uh, desperately trying to 
to inform the public, you know, because uh, some people are so simple-minded, they think any Muslim is a terrorist. If they don't, they don't differentiate. They don't see what they're doing. They just react. Uh, how we use words and and uh, that we we are conditioned by that. So the way out of suffering is through awareness, and then the conventional realities are in, in you know are are just that the 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 good ones we can use you know the uh, ones that you know help in in ways of creating harmony and understanding and and. Um, ways of relating to each other uh, that are respectful and, and uh, thinking in terms of ways that are, you know, a benefit to, to the worldly life that we're living. And then the, the conventions, the conventional realities that, that are harmful, like the prejudices, the biases, the... the that, that, that we can have through thinking, through cultural conditioning, we can, we don't, you know, we can recognize without giving them any importance, without attachment in any way to them. Let them be what they, they are what they are, but their nature is to cease. So in developing the path, you know, like being a Buddhist monk is a convention. Being, uh, it's a, it's not a person. So, the, the Buddhist monastic life is conve- is only a expedient convention, not a position, not an identity. So, in this way, you, you know, you, you're using the convention because it has, it's a, you know, it is. A, a convention based on nonviolence and selflessness, and its whole, you know, its whole. It's it's a convention that was created to to encourage awareness and liberation. But we can still use it all wrongly. You know, we can still identify with it and and uh, create an ego around being a Buddhist monk and things like this where, you know, that's, that's just a, a misuse of the convention out of ignorance.
Now, in in uh, insight <coughs> experiences, uh, somebody yesterday was talking about uh, having insight into the past, and so, and then. Uh, <coughs> And then how to develop the path, because uh, with insight, the insights you get through vipassana, uh, you have them, and they're valid, you know, they're not, they're, they're valid insights, path insights into the path. But then we remember, remember that moment, that's a memory. So it's, uh, you know, then we, and we aren't aware that we we attach to the memory of having an insight. And that attachment to a memory then confuses us because we're looking for it again. And insight happens, you know, it's not kind of like, a, you know, you, you, you realize, and, and it's not like you're, it's not a created state. So it's not coming from, holding on to a memory of the past, but it just, the first insight really is, it happens, and this, and you you see this. But then the tendency is to grasp the memory of it. So this is like what they call vipassanubha kilesa, or the defilements that come through practicing vipassana, is uh, (laughs) a... You attach, you have previous insights and you attach to the memories of them. So that's why Ujjupatipano or direct practice is, is here and now. It's not saying last retreat I had an insight into the past, but I'm not having any insight into the past right now. And then you, you know, so because you're, uh, the previous retreat is a memory right now. And the memory of an insight is not the insight, isn't it? I had a really good retreat last year here at Spirit Rock and saw the path. But I've certainly not seen it on this retreat. So, the, you know, insight into the path is, is awakening, you know, it is a, it's a very powerful and important insight. But then, right now, this here and now, you know, a memory of wanting to have that insight again is, is a desire that arises through attachment to the memory. Now, if you trust yourself just to be aware that this desire and this memory is the way it is, then you're actually developing the path. And so it's, it's, it's not so dramatic as the first insight. You know, it doesn't, you know, wow, this is the path kind of feeling. It doesn't seem all that at first, you know, very much at all because it, it it's not dealing with... with uh, with with a, a kind of totally new way of looking, but it's developing, cultivating the path that you've already had insight into. So so what I'm doing is pointing to to that. You know, don't 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 think that every vipassana retreat you go on, you're going to have you know fantastic insights because that that's just wanting you know longing for. Uh, pleasurable memories. And, uh, you know, I went through this uh, when I was a Samanera. I had, I had, uh, before I met Ajahn Chah, I had, I was in a place for one year by myself, a little kuti, and uh, went through all kinds of, uh, you know, mental experiences and whatnot, and and then, then I had some really powerful insights.
So, I mean, then these, these insights, I mean, really changed, you know, really awakened me, you know, that the Buddha Dhamma is real, you know, it's real, you know, I really understood it. This is it. But then, when the following year, when I became a bhikkhu, went to stay with Ajahn Chah, I kept thinking, remembering the previous year. And it made me discontented with the life I was living with, with Ajahn Chah because I wasn't getting those blazing insights. And so I, I, I you know, I thought, I wanted, I wanted to go back to the place I'd been before so I could have those insights. Uh, and, uh, and then I, uh, after the first Vasa with Lung Pa Cha, I went, uh, I left, went up to uh, Pupek Mountain in Sukhum Nakhon. That's why I met Jack Cornfield. <laughs> uh, he came to visit, because he was in the Peace Corps uh, in this town called Sukhum Nakhon. So, and I was in this place, this, this, this is one of the, uh, the highest mountain in, the, in this range of hills and he heard I was there and I was trying to to have the insights that I had the year that I was a summon era you know, I didn't have to work didn't have to you know didn't have to do all the things you had to do at Wat Pa I just thought practice 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 Nang Samadhi sit in Samadhi and then you can have those little insights again. Because <laughs> they were wonderful, you know. This, uh, this is it. Wow, gee, magnificent. Yeah. And then the grasping of the memory made me discontented when I went to uh, stay with Ajahn Chah. And then the, the six months I spent on top of this hill, you know, was was uh, nothing happened. It was just everything. I mean, everything I didn't want happened. It was miserable. Most miserable six months of my monastic life. <laughs> Why was that? And, you know, the conditions were good enough, but it was it was me, you know, grasping the memories of the previous year and then wanting them again. When actually, you know, when I, that because of that, I did see what I was doing. That the six months I spent there in utter misery, I did see what I was doing. And uh, then it became more apparent what the opportunity I had uh, living with Ajahn Chah. Because... You know, it was it was living the life, daily life, Buddhist monk's life, the routine, daily life of uh, Theravadan forest monk. Nothing dramatic, but just doing you know very routine, prescribed lifestyle, but developing the awareness. So so it became very clear, you know, what awareness. And that that this is the path. It's a matter of cultivating this awareness in the daily life, in routine, and and then of course in monasticism you 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 do you reflect putting on your robes and and uh, taking care of your robes and the bindabata the uh, collecting the food everything uh, a part of the monastic form is to cultivate this awareness. So it's all cultivating the path in a very direct way. But it's not dramatic. You know, when you think, thinking, when I had those insights in Nongkai, when I saw Manera, you know, that was, that's what I want again, because the memory was so ple- is so pleasant. Daily life isn't, you know, another Bindabata, getting up <laughs> in the rainy season, walking through rice paddies with, you know, fungus in your toes, and you think, 
gets so rainy and everything gets, you know, so damp and smelly. And you think, you know, this is, you know, another boring day in the monastery. <laughs> and then the awareness of this, this grumbling state, you know, I, another Bindabad, another boring. And then learning to trust this awareness that this is, this, this, these words, this complaining is a creation, you know. Sape Sankarani Cha. That's awareness. And so deliberately, you know, I began to deliberately uh, complain, to listen, not to believe my complaints, but to really feel the result of complaining, thinking in this negative. Another boring day in the monastery, rainy season, uh, fungus in your toes. This is, these are creations of my mind, aren't they? But the awareness, you know, that and the, and the, and the, and the, and the words, you know, you begin to separate the two. Awareness is not a complaining experience. Awareness is not negative, but it, it will reflect the, the conditions that arise. So you, you're developing this wisdom, this discernment that the path is not following the complaining, the conditions that can seem so real at the time, but to put them in the context of sape sankara nicha, all conditions are impermanent. So even in, you know, not such a kind of salubrious environment and ideal situation that, that, that I really like, but being able to, to uh, use just the, the routine, both the pleasant and unpleasant side of monastic life for awareness, for developing the path. And that's the challenge, you know. And confidence in this awareness. So that the, the complaining mind or the the, the mind that's, that creates problems into the present, you begin to see and, and no longer uh, let it um, delude. When you see the result of, of getting caught in delusions, uh, then you realize the suffering that you create and out of ignorance and attachment to the to the sankharas, to the conventions that we create. And the, that suffering is like this. Non-suffering, even with fungus in your toes, is not suffering. It is what it is. You know, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying that it's on, that, it, you know, I just love having fungus in my toes. <laughs> And I just, you know, really love going on alms round in the rainy season, wading through rice paddies. But um, it's not liking or disliking, but it, it's recognizing, realizing the path all the time, you know. So it's not a matter of, of things being pleasant or unpleasant, but uh, developing, cultivating this awareness. So this is like Buddha, Buddha knowing the Dhamma. And um, the knowing of the way it is. So it's now <laughs> 651. 6.51. I'm over time. <laughs> Just, uh... <laughs>
The blessed one's disciples who have practiced well, Sankang Dhammami, I bow to the Sankang. 